Great. Um, our, uh, our panelists can introduce themselves better than I. So without further ado, Lynn, why don't you kick it off? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, I am Lynn LaFonzaluca, and I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Club Catering and Event Professionals. And we started the association about um, 10 years ago, just in, in response to a need for education, training, and resources for the events and catering and food and beverage departments in your clubs. I've been in the industry about 28 years, started with Club Corp way, way back in the day, and was vice president for them uh, before moving on and starting the association. Excellent. Great to have you. And Bodo, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and thank you again for supporting this, this conference. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. I'm uh, Bodo Sieber, CEO of Tag Marshall. Uh, Tag Marshall is a golf course optimization system where we use GPS, IoT technology and data analytics to improve golf operations and help them do more with less, which is now more important than ever and obviously to maximize revenue as well. Uh, we're based in Atlanta as well as in Ireland, and you will hear a very efficient German accent <laughs> from myself. Um, and a word of warning, there's a high chance you'll meet either one of my two children in this session or a deranged cat that needs to be wherever there's an action. <laughs> so, word of warning, it's a new normal. <laughs> great, great. Thank you again for, uh, for being a part of the, of the conference. Ken uh, from Belfair. Ken, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for having us, Jack. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, my name is Ken Kozak. I'm the general manager, COO of Belfair. Uh, Belfair is a private gated community in Bluffton, South Carolina, and part of the Trim Privé division. Excellent. And Ken and I have been wanting to present together for a while now, and uh, Jack granted us the opportunity today. Um, and although we're not together, it's great to, to present with you virtually. Um, I'll remind the, the, uh, the attendees that you can use the Q&A uh, feature um, on, below your, your in the bottom toolbar of your Zoom uh, controls to shoot a, the panelists a question. We'll try to answer those as we per, uh, present and also um, following the, uh, the presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen and, and for my fellow panelists, just a reminder, just cue me to the next slide as, as was done prior. Um, let's see if this can happen here in proper fashion. Uh, stand by. Let me share. Apologize. Now we're ready to share. All right. Just going to help you? I, no, I've got it coming here right now here. Perfect. Start from the beginning. There we go. Stand by. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Look, looks good. Look, looks perfect. Great. Thank you for their patience there. So, um, I'm going to start real quick by, by just saying I've been trying to spend a lot of this time looking at what other people outside of golf are saying with regards to our relaunch and our recovery. And, and I want to share with you a couple of nuggets before we dive into our panelists' presentations. Um, certainly the DMOs and the CVBs, they're saying that what's going to recover first is local and regional travel. Um, so, you know, a lot of them are deploying their plans right now. If you're a uh, CVB in Arizona, you're going to launch Arizona campaigns first and then thereafter, as soon as California opens up California and have set circles thereafter. So certainly the recovery will come, will come locally first and then drive markets and then after that will be intra-state travel and, uh, and then long haul following that. So keep that in mind when you're planning on your, your, your marketing plan and relaunching. Another interesting nugget um, that, I, that, I, that we ran across in one of our, uh, our, our revenue manager uh, and I partook in a, a star report um, webinar. And it was pretty interesting that what the star report is showing with regards to the recovery, relaunch and rebounding. Um, they looked at uh, 
post trends of, of 9-11 and after the 2008 decline, um, when average rates dropped in the hotels and average occupancy dropped in the hotels, it was kind of interesting in, in 9-11, uh, they both in 9/11 and 08 both had a similar pattern. If average rates of the hotels and, and occupancy dropped for 12 months after 9/11, it actually took 24 months to recover and get back to pre 9/11 uh, levels. The same two-time trend happened in Revpar as well. You look at the 08 uh, financial crisis; we saw a decline in average hotel rates for even a longer period. It was actually 19 months. But that same two-time uh, recovery period uh, held true in 08 too, which was you know 39 months. So moral of the story is if 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 I hope it's a V-shaped recovery as the previous presenters shared. Um, if it's if it's a three-month downturn of of rate and occupancy, it's going to probably take us six months to get back to those three-month levels. If it's longer, it might it might hold a similar pattern as well too. Another moral of that story is. Don't be so quick to drop rate because if we drop rates, uh, it's going to be harder to recover. It's going to be take twice as long to recover. So think about how you can add value. And a lot of our presenters are going to cover uh, some great ideas on how you can add value along the way. The last thing that, that I want to share with you is, is, you know, we saw some of our hotel companies, sister hotel companies actually stop on social and, and go dark and not do email and not do social during this crisis. And um, I, I think we chose our, our approach from a Troon standpoint was to kind of continue to provide inspiration um, and, and continue to, to stay connected. And, and so a lot of the CVBs are doing the same too. And uh, one nugget I got from a CVB presentation was waterfalls and sunsets. There's something about an emotional connection that waterfalls and sunsets create. And certainly it's been hard uh, to wordsmith some of these and we have to be very sensitive so we're not tone deaf. Um, but, but providing people inspiration, staying connected and, and, and giving them imagery so that if they're at, you know, in a locale where golf is shut down, you know, they can keep that fuel for their fire burning. Um, and if they're in a place where they're not able to travel yet, um, they, can, they can hopefully keep that aspirational uh, goals in mind for future travel. So uh, just a few quick nuggets to kind of set the stage and, and create a foundation. Um, I'll go ahead and, and, and turn the, the reins over to Lynn and Lynn's going to share some, some great uh, content related to uh, catering and events. Great, thank you, Chris. You can go ahead and go to my first slide. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about this, my you know, wheelhouse, so five innovative ways to, to relaunch events and catering. I like to call it supercharging the rebound because I know there's gonna be this huge boom when we all come back. So next slide. So. The interesting thing, this pandemic and our club's reaction to keeping our members um, engaged has really put a spotlight on the events and food and beverage and catering departments in our clubs. What we've accomplished in the last few weeks and the way we've shifted and changed and adapted is absolutely inspiring. So I mean, our member engagement is just through the roof because of the way our clubs are connecting right now and all these brilliant ideas that everybody's come up with. So it does beg the question, why does it take a pandemic to shift our thinking and begin innovating? So the challenge now is to continue that quest when we return to the clubs. We don't have to stop this line of thinking. We can keep innovating. We can keep coming up with these amazing ideas and new and interesting ways to engage our members. So it's really, I'm, I'm saying, let's take the invitation that this pandemic has, um, has handed us to really take a leap forward in a new direction. So I have this graphic up on the screen. Oh wait, go back one second. Um, this graphic up on the screen, when all this is over, we're gonna throw the biggest St. Patrick's Easter de Mayo of July party anybody's ever seen. So I loved this. This came out of one of the webinars I did where we were brainstorming on events and that there is not a certain time or a certain way that we need to celebrate. It's kind of whatever it is. We can create you know, whatever we want. So one of my catering directors came up with this and I thought it was just amazing. So I just wanted to share that with everybody as well. I'd like to go to that party. It's gonna be incredible. Okay, next slide. So the first thought here is give permission to your team to innovate. So how do we transform? So the situation really forced us into this brainstorming mode and like, how can we still serve our members? So serving is our new selling. We're in service constantly to our members. So 
clubs have started, those marketplaces, selling groceries, takeout and delivery, of course, lots of virtual experiences going on out there, major social media happening, drive-by birthday celebrations, and daily communication. We really were in, um, encouraging clubs, communicate daily with your members via you know, video, social media, and also just good old fashioned phone calls, just picking up the phone, connecting with a member and saying, how are you? How are you dealing with all this? How can we support you as a club? How can we help? So it's just been just an incredible movement. But now that we know that we're capable of, no, of, um, of more, there's no going back. We have to continue in this amazing movement. So I also wanna encourage you to think about all these ideas that you've implemented during the shelter in place. Pick your favorites. Don't just let all that go to the wayside when we come back. Keep those innovative ideas going and keep those favorite ideas that your, that your members have really um, come on to. And also make sure that we keep this brainstorming you know, mode of our teams going and in place once, um, once we can, can open our doors again. Okay, next slide. So this one's all, all about private events, really the need, the desire, and the reason together. So we all know that private events and catering, um, you know, weddings, golf tournaments, birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, took a huge hit in all of this with everything being postponed and canceled. So the, the events industry created a campaign called um, hashtag postpone, don't cancel, to encourage events to delay and not cancel because we want to really try to keep as much revenue in 2020 also delay into 2020 rather than pushing things into to 2021. So this brought to light a really incredible point also that it's in times like these that our members and our event hosts are so happy that they chose the best and the most professional and expert partners at the club and vendors to to do their events with because that's who you want on your team right now when you're having to shift, adjust, plan, and replan some of these special occasions. So we're really encouraging the postpone you know, thought and postponing to weekdays because basically we're running out of weekends. We're running out of Saturdays, you know, Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays in you know, October, November, December when everybody wants to, to postpone to. So you might wanna think about um, you know, having some kind of incentive in place for when your event does come back. Maybe, you know, if you stick to your payment schedule, keep a cash flow coming, for, coming into your club. Maybe there's something we do that's a low, low cost to the club, but a high value to your member or event host, such as upgrading a bar to the next tier or, um, um, you know, adding an hors d'oeuvre, something like that. And also encouraging those weekdays, because again, we're telling people that bride will look just as beautiful on a Tuesday, the food will taste just as amazing on a Wednesday, the flowers will look just as pretty on a Thursday. So if the, the attendees who are supposed to be at your event will be at your event. Um, this is also the time to really be flexible uh, with our event hosts and our creative partners and our vendors that we're working with through all of this, because right now we're going to be judged on how we respond in this moment. So it's the time to be gracious. Um, I think this moment in time is going to change and define character. It's going to build character in a lot of us. At the same time, we have to be financially responsible to our clubs and you know, keep those you know, cash flow going and those you know, payments coming in on time. Take a fresh look at your contracts and your policies and procedures, adjust as needed right now because things are happening that we never thought you would happen. So maybe we need some new clauses in our contracts to also reflect that. I'm also asked right now what I think about prospecting and actively selling if this is the time for it. And I say, no, not really. It's, it's, uh, it kind of would be you know, viewed as opportunistic or um, insensitive in this kind of a time. So be there in a supportive way for everybody. Just do the right thing, I think is, uh, is, is you know, the message there. We also have a really great opportunity right now to reach out to our creative partners and our vendors to really brainstorm on how we can partner with them in a fresh way. So how can you combine efforts, create new experiences, bring technology, live streaming, and virtual events like we're doing today into a more mainstream thought process to enhance all of our event experiences going forward. 
once this is, you know, once we get you beyond this and open our doors, we will have a permanent shift from here forward, an absolute permanent shift to a higher level of technology and virtual events. So we have to be ready for that. We have to embrace it now, partner with whoever you have to partner with, make sure you have that technology available. Um, we also have time. We're always saying, we don't have time, we don't have time. Right now, a lot of people on your staff have time to update menus, update your collaterals, get reviews from members and event hosts to use in your marketing you know, once this is over, and learn some new skills. What, are your, you know, what does your team need? Do they need more food and beverage knowledge, more wine knowledge, more selling skills? Use this time to really up those, those skills. Okay, next slide, Chris. This is all about member events. So planning member events in a bold new way. So obviously the distancing has created this need and desire people are craving now getting together. We have to remember that our job is creating moments in our club and you can't, you just almost cannot do it better than through your member event calendar. So right now the planning must start for the events that are gonna come back into the club. And they have to be more thoughtful, more authentic, more over the top than ever. Um, I'm encouraging people to plan every detail of these events coming up, except the date. Get everything planned, linen colors, entertainment, food and beverage, absolutely every detail. Contact your vendors so that once we know dates, we're ready to roll. We've got all these events just in the can, ready to go. Um, this member event calendar really can't return to exactly exactly what it was before. We really need at this point to definitely up our game. I always tell people never ever do the same event exactly the same way twice. Whatever you're doing, change it up. Always have that element of surprise and delight for your members so that when they walk in the door, they're like, ooh, what's the club gonna do today? There always has to be that kind of that sense of excitement. Um, so the other thing here is that once these shelter in place orders are lifted, we really need to gauge right now how our members are feeling, how comfortable they're going to feel coming back into the club and when that's going to happen. And this is both for private events and member events. So how are you going to make your members and your event guests feel more comfortable in the club? So you might want to do a little survey now with your members and just ask them a question like, once shelter in place orders are lifted, when will you feel comfortable returning to the club? Immediately, one month, two to three months, four to six months. I did a survey like this um, recently and it was really interesting and it'll give you a good idea when and how to start planning that event calendar and how to maybe you know, ramp up to it. Um, so the other things to think about for when people are coming back into the club, attended sanitizing stations at the front door of the club maybe. Uh, maybe you hire a new staff member that's dedicated to member safety and sanitation and security. Um, and maybe limits on the number of people in your dining room and your, your ballrooms. Think about all those touch points in your club. The door handle when people are coming into the club. Buffet serving spoons, a self-serve coffee station, a water station. All these things need to be re-looked at. We can't have a traditional buffet anymore where people are walking down and you know, hundreds of people touching a spoon and talking over food. We have to rethink how we're absolutely doing everything in the club because that's what will, will make our members feel comfortable coming back in. So don't drop the ball on this piece. This is absolutely critical. Okay, next slide. Branding the moment. So everything we do right now, and it's not just with our members and guests, it's with our employees, it's with our creative partners. It's going to define your brand and what your culture is all about. So be so, so thoughtful and mindful of all of that. Sparking the rebound is, I think, people don't want to hear corporate speak. We have enough of that right now. People want that true authenticity. So just be genuine in all of your, all of your communication. Okay, next slide. Lastly, just be the hub for community philanthropy. So it's so inspiring to see how clubs have come out in force during the world crisis to help their, their um, individual communities. So outreach efforts, you know, feeding hospitals, feeding our communities, anyone who needs help. There was a club that donated golf carts to a local senior living community because they needed to like move their people around their own community. So the club donated cards for that. Just 
you know, all of these amazing stories have brought such an awareness to the world about the club industry, not just among ourselves anymore, but to the world, because now we're on the news, we're all over the place and people are finding out about, you know, how, um, about how incredible our club industry is. So now's the time that we can keep that thought process, you know, moving forward and become the go-to place to, to host local fundraisers, the charity golf tournaments, the school events for future members, and charities that are near and dear to your members' hearts. That's always a really good place to, to start in um, figuring out what type of fundraisers you want to do. So just a couple final thoughts. Um, just, you know, thinking big again. There's no expectation right now that's too daring, and there's no idea that is too big for this moment. We really have to remember that you all are the visionaries that are going to shape our industry going forward, and you're the world changers. You're the chain breakers, and you're the community builders. So I think we can take some bold steps right now and create a club industry that the world wants to be part of. So only good things and growth to come. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent, Lynn. And uh, I was looking forward to her session so much and uh, a lot of great points in there. Um, and, you know, to, to your point about number two, about postpone, don't cancel. I was talking to our event director at True North yesterday, and uh, she only had two uh, weddings that canceled in the spring. She has 30 spring weddings that are rebooking for the fall. And she's wow. kind of going the same thing. You're going, like, oh, my goodness, like, we're not going to yeah. have space. And, so That's again, right. to your point about weekdays versus weekends, um, you know, you know, maybe uh, people will have more flexibility to go to weekday weddings and and, and events at other times will be more traditional. And we're seeing that. that we're definitely seeing that that our brides and all of our event hosts are also just you know realizing we're all in this you know together. We have to be a little more flexible. So it's all right. good right, right now. Awesome. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna pivot to uh, to Bodo with, with Tag Marshall, and he's gonna share with you five innovative ways to relaunch your on course operations. Bodo, thank you, Chris, and and thanks, Lynn. That was very inspiring, and I'm glad to hear that people can still have their master's wedding, <laughs> even if it's later in the year. Because uh, postpone, don't cancel, right? Uh, just to echo what you said, Lynn, um, we've also seen an amazing ability of golf to innovate and adapt in these last few weeks. It's been really mind-boggling and super inspiring. And, and obviously our, uh, our um, focus is the on-course um, uh, op optimization and the operations, everything that happens on course, so that's your player movement, that's anything that moves on the course. And we have tracked at this point with Tag Marshall around 10 million rounds of golf. We work with uh, 30 of the top 100 clubs, that's your Pinehurst, Whistling Straits, Pebble Beach, Band and Dunes, but also lots of private clubs like Valhalla, Quaker Ridge, Baltusrol. Most of our clubs, however, are middle of the road clubs because that's obviously where most of the golf gets played. Um, and we use technology and data to get results. And obviously always looking to share as well of what we've learned um, over the years and also to share what we've learned from the very best operators out there. Um, if you want to jump ahead. Chris? Stand by. Stand by. <laughs> it was two, two I think you might jump plus one. So the, the interesting thing that, um, also again to echo Lynn, is that COVID-19 is really accelerating trends that were already reshaping golf. So a lot of the operators that are already ahead of the game and the future thinkers, the innovators, um, those are the things where the industry is already going. And, and the USGA's challenge to the industry echoes that. So they're saying that what we need into the future is a 25% reduction in the consumption of key resources. So that means yeah, we need to work more efficiently and a 20% increase in golfer satisfaction because we need to attract new players and we want to hang on to the players that we have and satisfaction and experience are key here. Um, so what, what we need to do in order to fulfill that is we need to know what counts. And, and if you want to have a certain percentage improvement, you also need to benchmark against something, right? If you want to get better, we need to know how, how we do that. And, and the one thing that we always give um, our operators is that uh, you have to think um, long term and you have to have an improvement mindset so that if you improve two percent every month if you improve three percent every month so over the course of two years you would have improved by 20 30 percent and that is exactly where the usga wants you to go because that means your your business is future proofing and that 20 30 percent means that you're not saving 20 percent or you can do more with less or more with the same 
or if you have an additional 20% in revenue, that's obviously game changing. And at a time like this, they say never waste a good crisis is uh, obviously prime to, to drive us forward and to help us push. And just to make that point as well, we had a really uh, a great webinar last week with three of our operators, that's uh, Pinehurst, East Black, and Meisen Country Club, uh, shared some insights into how they're responding. So the question was, how will your course adapt to post COVID-19? And we had about 150 people on and what they felt, so that is your crowd, what they felt was the most important uh, factors post COVID-19 was provide a safer player environment at 89%, that's key. Find ways to work with less touch points and resources. Uh, Lynn, you were saying that uh, that's also going to impact catering, but it, it certainly will happen and already is happening. And that's where so much innovation has already come to the fore out on the course. And uh, thirdly, use technology for great efficiencies. There were three others. One of them included dropping green fees, dropping dues. Uh, people don't want to go there, like you mentioned, uh, Chris. Um, and also um, uh, increasing intervals was something that a lot of people said we don't want to do. And, and we ha um, had that mentioned earlier. And, and the reasons for that, I want to jump into in a minute, but uh, go ahead. So, um, uh, just one more, sorry, Chris. <laughs> so if we're looking at our um, uh, ability and our opportunity now to really look at uh, running smarter on-course operations and providing a better play experience, it's more critical than ever. Why? Because the on-course operations that really drives the bus. Um, that's really where, why players come to your course sets, why uh, they come through, to your, through your gates. And that's also where they spend the most time. And right now, um, and tough as that is, food and beverage is restricted, pro shop is restricted. So the green fees and capacity really is key. Uh, and we don't want to um, yeah, leave anything on the table. Go plus one, Chris. So, well, what do we need to do if we want to increase golfer satisfaction and improve player experiences right now? So what is it that matters to players? So a lot of our operators feel um, because they're doing their own research as well and obviously talking to uh, their guests and members, safety, trust, feeling safe. Um, Matt Barksdale from Pinus made a big statement that we have to earn players' trust if we want them to come play here. Um, that is, uh, that is key. And then obviously flow of play, that was always a big topic, but now it's a different big topic because we need to provide an, uh, a landscape, an environment where there's no bunching and where we can look after people in terms of safety and how they perceive that experience out there. And at the same time, what always makes for a great uh, experience is a personal touch and on-call service. But how can we do that if we've got less resources available and if fewer touch points are recommended? So we have to do things with less people. Uh, jump one ahead. So to the point of um, increasing intervals, obviously that is a, an immediate thought. Why don't we just increase intervals to space people out? But uh, I would caution against that uh, because the, the risk and also the, the safety risk to players happens within that six feet. It happens in that sort of gimme. Uh, if you can smell what your playing partner has had for lunch and if it's had garlic and then uh, you're too close. <laughs> Um, so that's where it happens. And, and if you want to increase the intervals now to make people feel safer, you're adding 100 yards where you already have 300 yards. Coronavirus is not rocket powered. It happens in that touch space. So what we need to keep in mind is that is we don't want to go down a knee-jerk reaction road because what happens if we, for instance, increase nine minute intervals to 14 minutes, we're saying goodbye to 35% of our capacity and revenue. Um, and that is particularly hurts now where other revenue sources are restricted, at, at least for, for uh, the foreseeable future. So like uh, it was mentioned in the, in the previous panel, this is a field and a yield management opportunity rather than saying, okay, that's what we got to do if we want to open our gates. No, we don't, because at the bottom, you can see if we have that six foot distancing, if we have single riders, um, then we are ticking the boxes that we need to. Uh, jump ahead. So um, smarter on-course operations need to help doing more with less. We want to improve and control that flow of play and uh, so that we can have a, a safe and a tech managed uh, player movement. Um, that is something that traditionally has been done by marshals and it's something that really hasn't been that efficient. And now not, not only has it always been a big bugbear for players, um, it's a capacity risk and now it's a, it's a safety risk. So it's something that we really need to look at. We want oversight, uh, um, of the on-course operation with data so we really see what's going on and ultimately obviously save co costs and maximize revenue. 
So if we want to jump ahead, uh, Chris. So how do we do that? So it, um, there's already um, technology will help you immensely if you want to explore that. So imagine having the management power and automated data tracking of everything that moves on your course. So that includes your walkers, your single riders, your vehicles, machinery, your carts. Um, so that really gives you that, that superpower to dial in and optimize what you have, because right now you need to get the most that you possibly can out of your asset. And you need to provide what the players want, which is a safe and controlled environment. And that doesn't mean we need to um, have a knee-jerk reaction and, and increase our interval uh, by an age. No, it, it means we need to find smart ways to control that space. So the difference really between uh, with the operators that work with technology like this and the ones that don't is the difference between a 2005 era paper map and using Waze or Google Maps. So once you used Waze or Google Maps, you will not go back to your paper maps. And uh, also what we often hear, is, I can't believe that we've ever worked with our technology like this. It's just day and night. So like having radar all of a sudden, you know everything that's going on. And, and the, the great thing also is you don't need to change your operation overnight. You don't need to implement everything. You look at what is it that makes most sense for us? What is it uh, that we need improvement over? And then you can get started and bit by bit um, uh, adjust your operation uh, to, to be a little bit smarter than it was last season. Jump ahead, Chris. So ultimately what happens if you've got management data, you're also collecting data that helps you benchmark. Like we said um, earlier, if, we, if we're going back to the, uh, the USGA's challenge that we want to benchmark ourselves so we can keep improving. And ultimately what you're then getting is better decision-making. You really understand your course and variables that matter. Uh, so you don't have um, issues out there um, with, it, with regards to bottlenecks or inefficient staffing and things like that. And at Aaron Hills, for instance, that's worth $150,000 in additional green fees in a very short season, and that's just green fees. So once you've got more people through the gates, obviously there's additional revenue that you can drive um, with those as well. And it's, it literally is a game changer once you're dialing into this opportunity. Data and power superintendents drive savings, also great because once you know where everybody goes and where they don't go, you can really dial back on fertilizer, irrigation, man hours, um, where right now that matters. And that's exactly what the USJ is hinting at. And just my last point, uh, Chris, if you want to jump. So the nice thing is that right now you can really start relaunching your on-course operation so that you can do more with, le with less. And so many operators that have desperately tried to stay in play, they said, well, we normally do this with 50 people, now we've got five. <laughs> so how can we keep you know, doing this? Because uh, if uh, in three weeks time we, we are allowed to reopen or next week, are we really going to get back 50 people? No, but what if we get back 10 and we have some technology to help us uh, do more with less reduced hours and manpower? And ultimately what we're trying to do is provide the best possible playing experience, ensuring their safety, um, because that's what keeps people coming back. You're giving them what they want. and. Uh, down the line that uh, saves costs and, and maximizes revenue, which every business needs to look for, and now more than ever. So I hope there's, maybe there's been some questions, maybe you have one for me, uh, Chris. Thank you so much. Yeah, I did see one in the uh, chat um, related to uh, um, probably your revenue estimation with the inter interval increase. It said, doesn't that, does that assume 100% utilization or not? No, it doesn't. So that assumes a 60% utilization on an average threesome. So it's very conservative. And even at a $50 green fee, that can I mean up to half a million in revenue that you're giving away. It's literally like you've, you're, you're ripping out 30% of your seats on the plane, but you still have the same uh, cost to get it up um, every single day. And uh, Hardis uh, had a comment more than a question, uh, said with one player in a cart, the course will take the strain, compaction, et cetera. More money on maintenance, definitely a challenge. I don't think that was a question, more of a yeah, comment. I um, certainly a good appreciate comment. that yeah. as so that's well. Where you want, uh, that's where you want geofencing and so on to help you uh, keep the players in check a little bit uh, because a single rider as a cart is virtually the same weight as it was last season. So no, you can't go anywhere that you like now. Right. <laughs> and yeah, right. you're, you're quicker already, so you don't have to. Well, thank you for the comments and uh, questions. Uh, from, and uh, thank you, Bodo, for the great uh, insight that you shared. Um, our next presenter is uh, Ken Kozak, coming to you live from beautiful Belfair. Um, Ken, why don't you turn on your audio, and uh, then you can just take it from here and tell me when to uh, advance. Ken's going to focus on 
on, on some key thoughts really related to uh, private club uh, relaunching. Ken? Uh, thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, you know, first, first and foremost, um, you know, th this is not a one size fits all um, type, type of presentation on some of the things that we're gonna talk about. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as uh, we, we've heard from various presenters this morning, um, there is one thing that, that is it's really key, and that's communication. Um, you know, you don't, don't be afraid to over-communicate. Uh, and I think, uh, I think now more than ever, you know, there's a lot of anxiety uh, with, uh, you know, throughout the entire country. Um, private clubs are, are safe havens. Uh, for, for their membership. I know, I know ours certainly is. And uh, thankfully, touch wood, uh, South Carolina has been uh, one of the least affected uh, states of, of anywhere in the country, and we're, we're grateful for that. Um, but this isn't one size fits all. Uh, there are a couple of takeaways that we can, uh, we can move forward with, though. Um, communications key, now more than ever, uh, is the time to, to really tell your story as your club. Um, what makes your club unique? Uh, what are your unique selling points uh, that uh, that you can convey to to your various prospects or uh, to the to the real estate uh, community and and or or to that matter to those members that uh, uh, may think that they're not necessarily getting the the level of value uh, that they feel that they should be. Um, we are not taking a dues holiday uh, here at uh, here at Belfair, and that's something that. That, that I don't recommend uh, discounting or, um, or dropping price uh, at, at all, uh, not at this time. Um, you know, how and, how and what you do uh, to, to show value to your membership, um, you know, be it, uh, uh, be it free stuff, um, you know, that, that's built into your, to your dues uh, model or, or simply just taking it on the chin right now uh, with, uh, complimentary burgers and hot dogs for those for those clubs that that are available to to have golf um, or, or just you know pop up uh, pop up events uh, you know this past Saturday it was uh, you know we gave away free ice cream um, uh, for those that that were picking up to go meals um, and it wasn't just you know not, not just for for the people that placed orders but um, it was for anyone that uh, that lives within the community to, to come out. Um, over communicate with your members. Um, we send a daily email out, uh, and we've uh, we've attached you know our founder Dana Garmany at Troon uh, is a huge mu music buff, and he's kind of ingrained that in our company culture, and and we've taken it a step and attached that uh, in our daily uh, in our daily update as well. So this week it's America's greatest rock bands. Um, and uh, you know, there's a YouTube video that's attached with that. And uh, we, we started a, a process last week uh, in, in drawing a random uh, member, a random member number uh, to give away dinner for two every day um, from, from now till the time that we reopen. Um, random phone calls. You know, I, uh, I, I can't tell you how many emails I receive daily. Uh, you get emailed out. Um, and I think, uh, I think we, we need to revert back to what we used to do uh, before the, uh, the modern era, and, and that was pick up the phone and call people, um, you know, especially uh, those, those members that, that may be ill or, or elderly, uh, maybe they don't live here and they're, they're not necessarily engaged uh, as, as much as they would be uh, for a resident that, that is, um, and especially to your prospects. Uh, we've got a, a really uh, a really neat uh, app uh, through PaceSetter Technologies uh, that we've got the ability to share that app with prospects, um, so that it lets them be engaged in the club uh, when, when they're not uh, they're not here to to experience uh, Belfair and in everything that we have to offer. Um, I, I've talked to a, a number of peers throughout uh, throughout the pandemic uh, over the last five weeks, really. And, um, you know, the, the one thing that, that I was asked is, well, what are you doing with your marketing? Are you guys cutting back? Um, absolutely not. You know, I think now more than ever is the time to really put the pedal to the metal uh, in, in continuing with our marketing program. Uh, we just did an uh, update on our uh, virtual tour for our clubhouse 
um, that we've got the ability to share that with prospects now. And, um, you know, my, our, our, our philosophy is we want to be on the, the tip of the spear uh, when, when we come out of this uh, and, and ready to go, because uh, I do feel like it's going to be more of a V shape, uh, a V shape process. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're already seeing that through the amount of form inquiries and in, in our discovery experience already. Um, and don't, don't forget to engage uh, the realtor community. You know, uh, we are a private uh, equity gated community and we are dependent on, on uh, the churn from, from home sales. Uh, and our members expect to, to see their property values increase. So anything we can do to engage the realtor community and let them know what's going on, uh, you know, our gates are not open to, to anyone that just wants to come in and, and view a, a particular home that's listed. Uh, we will schedule private appointments uh, and that's been very popular. Um, you can switch slides, please. Um, you know, the, the new normal, um, you know, we are going to keep, uh, we're, we're going to keep a lot of the, the innovation that, uh, that our team has, has come up with over the last five weeks. Um, we're going to, we're going to keep that in place for, for, uh, for a while. Um, we are going to move, we are going to continue to move forward with the single cart policy, um, at least for the time being. And, um, you know, I think that uh, there, there's uh, that that's a great way to reduce a lot of angst and anxiety uh, for for people. And like I said, you know, uh, we're we're fortunate enough that uh, golf hasn't been affected, uh, so this is by no means a, a one size fits all. Uh, boutique dining experiences, um, I think those are going to be more than popular, more more than ever. Uh, they're going to be so much more popular now. Um, in, uh, in associating with, uh, with, with your closer friends or your family, um, you know, we're going to let the, uh, we're going to let the, the, the governor and, and local, uh, local authorities, uh, dictate, um, you know, exactly what we can and can't open. Um, you know, right now it looks like, uh, there is going to be a, a limited capacity, uh, when, uh, when we are given the green light. Um, so, you know, uh, first and foremost, we want to make sure that um, that our members and our staff are in a in a safe and secure environment. Um, you know, the uh, to go ordering for us, um, we'd always done to go business, um, but uh, it was very limited in terms of menu offerings. Um, we opened up the full menu uh, as well as through through our pro, uh, our. Uh, vendor relations through uh, through Cisco and U.S. Food um, have have managed to uh, establish a member commissary. Um, it costs plus twenty percent. It's uh, it's less expensive than going to a grocery store, and you don't have to leave the gates. And that's something that uh, that that we are going to keep in place. Um, you know, I've spoken to our board on on a number of occasions, and. Uh, you know, we're doing anywhere between uh, uh, 1500 to $2,000 worth of commissary sales a day. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that, that shows a tremendous amount of value um, and, uh, and certainly helps with the, uh, the apprehension of members having to, to go to the grocery store. Member engagement. Um, don't, be for, don't be afraid to give away the free stuff. Um, no dues holidays or, or concessions. Um, Figure out how you can uh, how you can add value. Um, you know, we would typically do anywhere between uh, three to four hundred on uh, on on Easter Sunday brunch. Uh, on Saturday uh, prior to, to Easter, um, we would have an event for eight hundred people, uh, complete with Ferris wheels and and carousels and petting zoos, and we simply weren't in a position to do that this year. Uh, but what we did do is we gave away free cookies um, and, uh, you know, uh, mimosas or Bloody Marys, whatever, whatever you can come up with. Um, you know, everyone likes free stuff, especially um, when, uh, when, when it's random and, and it's not, uh, not necessarily planned. Um, alternative sources of engagement. Um, part of our daily update um, 
is going through and really identifying um, uh, some some really cool lecture websites. Um, we we have a, a regular lecture series uh, here at the club that uh, you know we, we we simply can't engage anymore. Um, but you know our members can do it from the comfort of their own home, be it uh, TED Talks. Um, or you know Kennedy Center Live um, and, and their digital platform um, for for those that are uh, more right-brained uh, than, than left. So, personal shopping program. Um, this has been this has been a home run for us. Um, you know we we do uh, quite retail sales um, in, in our in our golf shop uh, through a cost plus twenty percent program, um, but. You know, we've had our, our retail manager um, reach out to our to our our, our highest spending members, um, and uh, and offer personal shopping um, services for them. So I think anything and everything that uh, uh, that you can do right now, you know, there 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 are no there are no dumb ideas. Um, don't be afraid to try stuff. Um, and you know, ultimately, you're going to create the raving fans. Um, th those members that, that may be on the fence, um, that, uh, you know, were, may, may have some reluctance, be it, uh, be it experience or, or from a financial perspective, uh, I guarantee you're going to win them back um, and, uh, and create raving fans from that. Um, some ideas, reward your top spenders. Uh, they're going to come back. Um, but, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, that, that you show them uh, how much you appreciate them right now. Um, Free member guest days. You know, for most of us, uh, go golf co you know, golf costs nothing. Um, don't be afraid to uh, to you know uh, to roll out the red carpet and uh, and allow your members to show off their club uh, to to their friends and their family. Um, don't forget the kids. Uh, you know, we just uh, uh, we just had a, a, a new splash pad built. Um, that uh, that we opened in in October uh, of last year, and uh, and and ha haven't really experienced uh, uh, you know the season for it yet, uh, and and we're going to show that off uh, to the kids when uh, when when we're able to open the pool and, and facilities back, and then right. I think lastly, um, you know, uh, move to community engagement. That that is. Uh, you know that that's that's really a key um, in in being able to uh, being able to connect with the community, even though uh, we're we're a gated property, and um, you know we uh, we had a, a food drive over the last couple of days. Uh, we brought in Bluffton Self Help, um, and and you know offered canned good drive, and, and our members really enjoyed. Uh, they, they're they're a very giving group of people. Um, but uh, anything that we can help the community, um, pair up with your peers. Uh, don't don't be afraid to reach out to other clubs within your area, and find out what they're doing. Um, I think I think before you know, uh, as Lynn pointed out, um, you need to take a survey and take the pulse of of what your membership um, would like and and what what they feel or. or What's what do they imagine your club looking like uh, when when you when you're in a position to reopen? Um, you know, are they going to be comfortable uh, using the fitness center? And if so, what is that? You know, what is that type of maximum capacity? How many people would they feel comfortable with uh, being at the swimming pool or playing tennis? Um, those are all very very important um, conversations that can take place. So. Um, you know, like I said, uh, it's not a one size fits all. Um, it's different for everyone, but uh, hopefully, um, some of you will be able to take some of these ideas and establish. Great, thanks, Ken. And I have a uh, there is a few questions, but um, uh, one of them I think you answered. Any give back ideas to members who have paid their membership but can't play because we are closed? And you spoke to that a little bit with the virtual. Uh, programming. Anything else you want to add in addition to what you've already presented, Ken, uh, concisely, shortly, because we're running out of time? You know, I think, uh, I think uh, complimentary guest fees, um, complimentary guest fees, uh, club credit uh, that they could use in food and beverage or in the golf shop or, or guests. Um, 
just uh, try, try, to avo try to avoid uh, reducing dues as much as possible because you're going to have back from that. Great. Well, thanks again, Ken. Uh, I'm going to bring us home with some concepts for relaunch. You know, Ken spoke to uh, you know, more private centric uh, locales. I'm going to speak to a few, you know, resort daily centric, uh, daily fee centric uh, relaunch concepts, but, you know, really could kind of cross over to both, both environments. And then we'll try to get to some of the remaining questions that were posted or we'll, we'll reply to those virtually. Um, we believe that prepaid is going to be here to stay. It was brought up earlier. Uh, this is a screen grab of, of World Golf Village where 100% of the tee times, if you look on the left side here, are all prepaid. Um, and this is a booking engine. It's an easy links booking engine. You know, now it's an easy links booking engine that's in the Golf Channel family of, 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 of technology. And they have the ability to do prepaid tee times online. Um, I know what the retail team's going to say. The retail team's going to say, "Well, wait, we're not going to sell any, any, any merchandise." And you know, I, I keep going back to. I'm sure there was a time when 7-Eleven executives were talking about pay at the pump, saying, "Wait a minute, if we have everybody pay at the pump, we're never going to sell a Slurpee again." Well, guess what happens today? I pay at the pump, and if I want a Slurpee, I go into the 7-Eleven, I buy a Slurpee. You know, and, and so the sales still happen. So I think. You know, this is a this, I, this is a movement I'm encouraged to see, and uh, one that we've been we've tested um, in prior to this this pandemic. But um, I think it's going to become wider adopted uh, throughout our industry, and we should try to do all we can to support this and, and message this uh, it, to our to our stakeholders. The second thing would be reward your reward your loyalists first. You know, uh, we spoke about you know not not. Uh, about not discounting or dropping average rate on hotels and how it takes twice as long to build that back up again. You know, we're going to, we're going to look to our loyalists first. And, and if you have a loyalty program, like those need to get your welcome back to golf campaign first. Um, but rather than, than discount externally, you know, reward internally. And that doesn't devalue your brand at all. Um, this is an example of, in our case, we have True Rewards, which is about a half million folks that are signed in and opted in. And we're, you know, we're, in, this is an, an Arizona example where we're still able to play golf in Arizona. And, and we, we sent an opportunity, True Rewards opportunities near you. You know, there's 29,000 True Rewards members in Arizona. We want to reward them, the ones that are spending dollars with us first, uh, and give them the rewards first and get, invite them to play golf first. Um, and, and, I'll tell you what was really interesting about this uh, to the point of other presenters, we had to be really careful with the language. I mean, I don't know if my job has been harder in the past six weeks that it, um, it, you know, can you imagine having to market golf in a market where everybody's telling you to stay home? Like it's totally counter. And um, if we do, we have to do it really sensitive. And, and so you, we, we spoke, to, if you look at the first line of this left email, it says for those looking to, to, to stay active, get outside and enjoy the sunshine during these challenging times. We wanna share a few opportunities that are near you. In, in, in my mind, like that felt right. That felt authentic, sincere. And I, you know, I acknowledge the state that we're in today. And, you know, we had to really tone down our salesy language, which frankly is a little hard for me, but, uh, but we've filtered that down. And this is on the right side is an example of how a club, you know, rewarded, you know, not just giving an Arizona resident reward, it's an Arizona resident reward if you're signed up for the loyalty program. So it captured data, which the club captures that data and goes in their email database and makes their long term email cost uh, more, more cost effective. So reward loyalty first. Consider alternative forms of transport. You know, we t there was a question earlier in Bodo's session about, you know, uh, the compaction on the golf course and single use carts. Yeah, we totally agree. Um, we're in, in clubs where we have fat scooters and other single use technology, um, having rickshaws to, and promote walking, um, these are 100% these are prescribed at courses where we have these. And I think Ken even had a big order at Belfair that he's bringing in some fat scooters, kind of in response to the, the single cart, single rider usage. So now's an opportunity, if you haven't done this at your club, consider alternative forms of transport and market that. Definitely promote and leverage wellness. We were kind of speaking to that even before this crisis that there was a wellness movement, but even now, so it's even more important. Um, you know, we, we need to promote the the the, be the benefits of being outside, being you know, smell the green grass, be out you know in wide open spaces, you know, stay active, and and do promoting it from a golf standpoint, but then also uh, 
course, it, communicating all the, the fitness elements around your club, whether that's yoga uh, opportunities or whether that's fitness sessions or stretching sessions or stay at home sessions. And, um, you know, if you, if you could go to trin.com slash moments, trin.com slash moments, that's where we've aggregated all this great content and virtual content. It's, you know, I know we have our competitors on this call, but we're kind of, to use a, a trite term, we're all in this together. And to the extent you can see how we're kind of creating inspiration uh, for our constituents, and these are these are for our members, these are for our daily fee guests, these are for our club operators to use and, and communicate and repurpose for their own. So uh, certainly, you know, leverage the opportunity, leverage the messaging of health and wellness and how we can all play a part in that. We, we have a unique opportunity to play a part in that as we relaunch and recover. And then there, certainly this is our moment to help. Uh, each, of, each of the presenters alluded to this in some way or another. Um, we had instances at Indian Wells Golf Resort where they're closed, but the, the team on the left here, they, they decided to make masks for local healthcare providers. Um, on the right side, we uh, we did some food donation. All of our clubs in the Phoenix Scottsdale market turned into food donation drop-off spots because uh, you hear about healthcare workers. The second thing, the second thing that's this is impacting is food banks, and to the extent we can impact and help food banks in a positive message. Uh, this is this is a, that, that that's that's a good movement there. We actually even had an Arizona centric summer card promotion that we did, and we were slated to launch it May second, but we accelerated the launch April first because our target market shift from national to local, and uh, and and we tied in a, a donation to the St. Mary's Food Bank, and and it it was a good thing. We're going to donate seventeen thousand dollars in three weeks to the local food bank through this local promotion. And, uh, and it, in, in some sense, it kind of gave us a little bit of a license to market. So um, it, it, and it also felt good along the way and it's our way of helping our local communities. So certainly uh, make this your moment to help. Um, those are a few key, key thoughts. Again, great, great thoughts from everywhere. I think we're, we're pretty much out of time at this point, um, but let's see if we can answer a, a few questions. We talked about dues restrictions. Um, which, which type of employees have been furloughed most often within a club when things turn around and what type of employees will be most needed? Uh, who wants to address that on the panel? I can, I can start. Um, I think, um, I know a lot of the food and beverage crews have been, um, have been furloughed. Um, I, I think when you're thinking about bringing people back, you know, think about, you know, not only what is necessary to keep the maintenance of your club going, but think about revenue, who drives revenue. Think about your, you know, catering and event professionals, membership, um, the ones that are going to help you get the revenue back and kind of get the, get the club going again from that you know, point of view. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you all panelists. Thank you, uh, everyone that was engaged in the presentation and the Q&A. Uh, I encourage you to stay tuned for the remainder of this Golf Inc. Summit. And, uh, um, and again, uh, we look forward to bright days ahead. Thank you very much, Chris. Really appreciate thank it. You. Take care, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. <clears throat> you guys went a little long. We're okay because it was good stuff. <laughs> usually when we're at the live one, I usually stand at the back of the room and keep walking forward until I get right in their face and they stop. But uh, Chris, Chris did a great job. Really appreciate everyone helping us there.